welcome back to part four. In part four, we're going to try to figure out uh, in our script a way to generate what is the first day of the month. And then also we want to clear the cells of the entire form in case uh, there's any information in there we don't want to overlap. We also want to figure out a value for how many days are in the month. So just to reiterate, in our original form, when we choose a date, it fills in all the cells that need dates. But we need to know what day of the week to start on. In other words, in the selected month, what is the first day of the week? So we know what position to start in. And so we need a numeric value that will correspond with these columns. In our hierarchy here, you can see each column has a numeric cell value. So this is cell 1, cell 2, cell 3, and so on. And no matter what row we're in, this is row 2, it's still called cell 1. And that's important later on when we're going to loop through and actually assign values to each of these cells. We want to maintain consistency. We want all the cells to be named accordingly all the way down and they are. So how do we find the first column? Well, I'm going to write in the code right here and then explain what it is. So the first day of the month code is this code right here. Let me tell you what's going on here. We're declaring a variable first of all. That's what the VAR symbol means. We're calling the variable first column. It doesn't matter what we call it. We can call it anything as long as it's not a reserved word. And I want to make it intuitive. So the first column, meaning the first column where we're going to start. And that's going to equal first day dot get day. But now, what is first day? We don't have that here. And so I want to make sure I work backwards to let you know how I did this. First day is going to be another variable. It's going to be set equal to a new date object. And that date object is going to be the first day of the month of the raw value of the date field that we've chosen. So we want to create a new date object. And remember, currently our date object, the current date object we're using is D. D was declared way up here at the top as a new date object based on this dot raw value. That's our current working date. That's so if a, the user chooses December 10th, 2019, D would be equal to December 10th, 2019. And then we're using that to do all this work so far in the script. But now we want to say, okay, if they choose December 15th, that doesn't give us the first day of the month. We want to know what December 1st is. And so we need to declare a new object based on D and use, and use it to get the first day of the month. So we want to declare the date object with get full year. The inside the parentheses is going to be year, month, and day. That's how the parentheses go. That's how the parameters go in this function. And so D dot get full year. We want the year of our first day variable to be the exact same as the one that's chosen. Also, we want the month to be the exact same as the month that was chosen. The only thing we want different is the day value. And so here we're going to just put a one, meaning we want the first day of the month. We don't want, if, if somebody chooses February 2nd, we want February 1st. And so we always will just use the two year and date from the choice, but we're going to make the day one. And that's going to equal the first day of the month. Okay, so there's that. But then also we want to go, what is the last day of the month? And this will give us the answer to the question we defined right here. How many days are in the month? Well, what is the last day? And uh, fortunately, JavaScript gives us a function to do this with. And it's very similar to this function we just used. So we want, this, we want to use the same year. We want to use the same month. And we want to use zero. But there is a gotcha. When you use zero instead of one, one will give you the first day of the month. Zero will give you the last day of the previous month. And so that's going to introduce a problem. Last day, we don't want the last day of the previous month. We want the last day of the current month. But there's no way to write that in JavaScript. And so what we have to do is we have to add a month to our get month value. So if this 0 equals, so we, let's say we chose 
December 15th, 2019. The last day of the previous month would be November 30th, 2019. And we want to know what December last day is, which would be 31. By adding this one right here, it kicks it back to December and then gives us the last day. So a little, a little trick there. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this comment and put it right here, corresponding with that line. All right, so we're still here in this first column. We haven't done anything with this yet. The first column, meaning the first day of the month, is the day of the week that this variable called first day generates. So how do we get that? First day of the month, first column. So I'm going to say first day dot get day. So get day is just another function provided by JavaScript. And again, you have to use your helps to figure these things out. Get day gets the weekday as a number, 0 to 6. So 0 being Sunday, Monday being 1, Tuesday being 2, and so on. So we're using our helps to figure out these functions. Get day is a function. So first column is going to equal, then, 0 through 6, which would correspond then to our cells here, 1 through 7. And we'll have to add 1 to it to make it work right, but that's, that's getting us a numeric value that corresponds to these days of the week. Okay, so let's test this. Let's test this to see if it's really working. And you've seen me do this before, but I'm going to explain why I do it now. I use the app.alert as a, as a way to give me a pop-up in the development of the script to tell me if I'm on the right track. I'm going to do a pop-up to say, all right, what is first column? When I choose this, I want to make sure it's the right one. So let me show you how this works in my debugging or my testing. I'm going to choose December 11th, and what I would expect to see when I choose December 11th, 2019, is the first day of the month to be a Sunday. Let's see if that happens. And so I have a pop-up JavaScript window here, which is supposed to be, what is the first column? Well, it's column zero, and that would make sense. Column zero represents ordinally this column. So that's exactly what I want. Let's do it now for the other variables we had. Let's do first day and do the same thing. We're going to pick December 11th and we would expect the pop-up to give us the first day of the month as a Sunday again. Sunday, December 1st is the first day of the month and that makes sense. That's good. That's what we want. All right, now let's do the last day. Again, we're just doing this to test. And later on, we can just remove this line of code. What is the last day? So if we choose December 11th again, the last day should be the 31st. Tuesday, December 31st. Okay, so these, we know now that these variables are producing correct results. And you can test this uh, further by choosing different months to make sure it works. But uh, suffice it to say that, okay, this is what we want. These three variables are working like we want to. And now we need to move into using them to fill out the form. But there's another problem we need to face first. And again, this is not something that initially, if you're, if you're writing scripts, you wouldn't initially think of this. But it, it, it does come into effect. In our original form, the one that works correctly, let me just demonstrate this to you. We choose a month. Let's say we we'll choose December 2019. It fills out everything. But what if we go and choose another month now? Let's say we skip forward to April of 2020. When we do that, the first thing that needs to happen after we choose that, before the, the days are filled in, is the old month needs to be wiped away. If I had March in here, Sunday has a 1, Monday has a 2, Tuesday has a 3, and so on. I need those to be blank. But in order to do that, I need to get out of the way what's there. And so we need a function or we need a, a process in our script to just wipe the whole table clean. And I think now's a good time to show that because we're going to use some of the things we learn in doing this wiping the table clean later on when we're filling the table out. So I think now's a good time to introduce the topic of looping. We need to create a loop where our, that will take our, our program 
through each of these cells one by one and perform some kind of action on them. And so we know that there are seven columns and there are six rows in our table. And so we need a way to go six by seven or seven by six through the table. And so we can create a loop to do that by using the for loop. So this for loop basically just counts from one to seven and whatever's inside these curly braces, whatever action is inside these curly braces will happen seven times. And so we could say app dot alert i and i is the variable that's controlling the loop. So i starts off as one and as long as it's i is less than or equal to seven, continue in the loop and each time through the loop, add one to i. So i the first time equals one, the second time equals two, and so on to seven. And then just pop up an alert that says which time we are through the loop. And so let's just watch this happen. So there's the first time through the loop, and seven times through the loop. And so we've created the basic structure now of a loop where we can do something seven times. But there's a problem. If we do something seven times, let's just say we do it, we make table row one, cell one, raw value equal to i. All that's going to happen is, of course, very quickly in this scenario, the Sunday date right here is going to change values from one to seven very, very rapidly. So rapidly we didn't even see it happen. So this really doesn't help us much because it only takes us through the first row. We need to now go through all of the rows. And so one of the ways we can do that is by nesting a loop inside of a loop. So we can say, and we're going to use six here because there's six rows, not seven. There's seven columns, but only six rows. And then we're going to nest inside of this loop of seven, a loop of six. So this loop happens seven times. This loop happens six times. But now we have a problem. We want each row to be dealt with in turn, and then we want to go across the row. So we need to really swap these. We need to make this the, the parent or the, the first loop and we need to make this one the second loop so we start off in row one and go all the way to row six while we're in row one we go through each cell one by one and do some action so i'm just going to put here a comment do something and so each time we do something inside of the seven loop that would be moving across the page each time we do something inside of the row loop That'd be moving down the page. And so now let's put in our app.alert and watch. We'll start with J and then we'll watch I. All right, well, let's just do it this way. We'll say row and so this will happen each time through 42 times. This will get a little redundant, but this alert will show us where we're at each time through the loop. All right, so let's choose our date. All right, we start off in row one, cell one. And then we move to row one, cell two, all the way to row one, cell seven. And then the next time through the loop, it goes down to row two, cell one. And all the way through so now we have a way to get through the 42 cells of the table uh, numerically speaking. But we still have a problem. We have no way to use these variables in our object reference. So in other words, if we wanted to assign a value to table month row one, cell one, we could type that out like so. We could say this equals something. No problem. But the next time through the loop, we're still just assigning row one, cell one, because we've hardwired in these numbers. We, we need to do something like this. We need to be able to put in row J and cell I. That's what we need to do. 
Um, but JavaScript won't allow this because you, these, these braces here uh, are reserved for arrays only. And we're not inside of an array. We're inside of an object, um, an object that represents this table. And so if we tried to run something like this, we would just get an error. And basically the error is saying in line 57 of our script, it doesn't know what to do with this row because it, it's, seeing, it's seeing our object declaration, table month, row, bra bracket J. It's seeing it as us having a, an object called table month dot row. But we have row one, row two, row three, and, on, and so forth. We don't have anything called table month dot row. So this doesn't work. We need a way, in other words, to do this. And that's where the beauty of lifecycle comes in. The most important thing I'll probably teach you in all of my videos is how to use this function called resolve node. And I'm gonna talk about that in the next video. So I'm gonna close this one off for now. And in the next video, we're gonna go over this very important topic, function resolve node. All right, so stay with us and we'll get into that next time.